And we are back with AR Sales, aka the ART Podcast. I am Mayor Mina Bala, and today I am joined by Lucian Telford, Hello. author of The Sequence, an amazing sci fi coming to you by Freezen Press, friends of the podcast. More than excited to talk to this fellow author. How are you doing, Lucian? Lucian I'm doing really well. How are you? It's actually funny. We were just talking about proper pronunciation of your name right before we got on. And as he told me the wrong one, I just pr- said the wrong one right there. <laughs> you course, got it in my of head. Course, of course. Um, of course. You can just, just call me Loose. Everybody calls me Loose. Loose. Hey, okay. Uh, now, before we dive into like the meat of everything, where can people find you, your website, Instagram, Twitter, any social media that you have? Uh, currently, you can find me at Lucian Telford. Uh, and uh, I'm on Twitter and on Instagram. Uh, the website is lucientelfordbooks.com. And I'm also on Goodreads at Lucian Telford there as well. Pretty sure. Um, yeah, those are the places you can find me and a little bit about me. Now, before we dive into the meat of the, of the book and everything in, in relation to that, talk to me a little bit about your beginnings of writing. Where did it start? Was it something that happened at a young age? Did it come through a love of reading, movies? Uh, all of the above. <laughs> um, I, was in a, I was in a band uh, as a teenager and we used to write some songs together there. So there was a little bit of, I had some creative energy from a long time ago, but it wasn't really well directed. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've, I've still got, I can see my comic book boxes over there in the storage. So I, used, I grew up reading comic books and I used to draw my own comic books and write really bad stories for my own comic books. Um, but really for, uh, for, for this book, uh, you know, I needed a creative outlet and, uh, and I, was based, I was based in Calgary for a, a winter and uh, rather than spend that winter out drinking with my friends every night, uh, I decided to take some creative writing classes and, uh, and give, give this energy some direction. And uh, so that's really where, where this started um, with the sequence. My God, I, I empathize with that energy so much. There was just a, some point like during college that it's like, all right, now I love being like a work professional and then like working for the weekend. But like, at, at what point am I just like, you know, like it, it's weird now because now I'll, I'll do, a, I'll spend my Friday night working and then like I'll wake up feeling like achieved because you did some, like, you know, you just knocked out an extra chapter, you did X, Y, Z. And while I love going out and I'm not, I don't want to take that out of my life. It just, it, it's so different where like you put like your energies towards when you really feel like, hey, you know what I want, I want to change. I want something yeah. positive. I want to do something more with my, with my time. Yeah. And I, I really went through that. And uh, again, like, like you said, uh, the achievement or the feeling of achievement, having spent a night writing or, or even just, just working on ideas rather than waking up with a hangover, uh, Where am so I? much better, so much Where better. I'd much, for, much prefer that on a regular yeah. basis. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm sure we can go to tit for tat with stories about that. But um, yeah. <laughs> as far as the sequence, which again, just from what I've gotten into it, and we'll dive into a little bit more in just a second, but mm. it seems to go parallel so well with what is currently going on in the world as far as like the progression of technology and what we seem to be kind of focusing a lot on, which is like genetics. Right. So, um, you, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I was going to say, please, go, like, uh, talk us about it. Yeah, talk us through that. I mean, I, I, four years ago, I conceptualized a lot of the stuff that's, uh, that's in this book. And, uh, and obviously, things have moved along significantly in those four years uh, gen- in, and in, within the field of genetics. So I, I think uh, I, I've, I've gotten lucky in as much as uh, it's very much in, in the news now today. Um, and we're talking about the ability to even cure some genetic diseases, not many, but a couple. Um, and I think that the technology, like you said, has moved along so much in the last four years and imagine where it's gonna be in 10 years and imagine where it's gonna be in a hundred years, which is really where I, I took this book. So um, uh, yeah, you know, uh, I, I really, it was just taking dark 
dark, deep, dark dives on the internet and looking, looking for uh, where genetics was going because I thought it was interesting. And, uh, and it, it was terrifying four years ago, but what was, what was being, what was being done and what we're capable of now is uh, very much like, I don't think it's going to take a hundred years to get to the place that this book <laughs> takes place. Man, I so agree with that. I mean, um, you know, Brave New World, Aldous Huxley, that was 1934. He talked about like all the cloning and genetic stuff before that science even existed. And he predicted basically the next 40 years of, of genetics just off that book. Yeah. And he predicted that it would take longer than that. And it happened within fruition with just the 40 years. Nothing. Quick. Yep. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think there's a there's a great William Gibson quote that uh, the future's already here. It's just not very evenly distributed, and uh, I, I feel like that's uh, that's relevant here to uh, to the sequence. I'm sorry, I keep looking. I keep looking down into the. To the no, right. show it off. Give, a, give it a, give it a. That's, the that's where my book is. The yeah. sequence. There we go. Catwalk across the screen. Yeah, the the binding, the back. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Nice, man. My freezing press. I think, uh, and like, uh, this is the single only copy in existence right now. This is a a, uh, a proof um, for me alone. And uh, just to see it in, in hard copy is uh, it was an emotional moment when I got to unwrap that box. Yeah. Yeah. Now, that is an interesting. How did you get a proof hard copy without the proof, uh, not to take your light here, but how yeah, yeah. without the proof line? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, I, I requested a physical proof copy from, from Freezen Press. Uh, the advanced reader copy that um, I think you have a copy of uh, does say, you know, not for resale everywhere. Mm -hmm. This one doesn't. I don't, I can't answer that question. <laughs> At no yeah, point does it say this is a physical reader proof. I mean, it will look different than every other print copy ever because there's no reviews on it. Yeah. And assuming there's a decent review that comes out, then... Uh, Hopefully there will be some more, some more print on that. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know. You'd have to ask the publisher. No, I mean, I, I really think uh, and about that review thing. I have no doubt. I mean, Friesen Press, every, every person that I've talked to about it is really coming with it. And you're actually the first uh, sci-fi author to come and talk to me from Friesen Press. So I'm really excited to dive into the actual plot of the book. Can you kind of go into it? The main character or one of them is Kit genetic sense uh well right? yeah there's i mean you know while i was writing it up i i kind of got to the place where there's two protagonists but really it's about dallas um and dallas ward is a uh ex suborbital pilot and when we think suborbital let's think like uh richard branson and uh, what he just did with virgin galactic which i mean he went up drifted okay. for a bit and floated back down but if we imagine that uh they took that to the next level and uh, got that thing into a suborbital flight where they could go from like Singapore to LA in a couple of hours or less. So he's, he's an ex suborbital pilot that kind of lost his way uh, and found his way into uh, flying a low level ground effect stealth jet carrying contraband for the, uh, for a Hong Kong triad uh, <clears throat> to make ends meet. So that's, that's what he does um for a living and uh and it's really the book is about it's a hero's journey for him um you know trying to find his way he doesn't want to be where he is uh so he's uncomfortable in a position but he's very good at the position and he loves flying which i can relate to as uh as an airline pilot so uh it's yeah it's it's a hero's journey for him a kit uh, I don't want to give too much away about Kit, but uh, she's she's the genetic engineer um, that's at the end of the day not a great person, hmm. um, and uh, and she's she's doing things for her own selfish reasons, um, and she has a secret project. I don't know how far you've gotten into the book, but uh, she's a secret project that she thinks she's keeping a secret, but uh, isn't, and that's going to cause a lot of problems for her. Hmm. And we have uh, Fong and Wu, who are a couple of detectives in Hong Kong that are uh, just starting to, they're uh, discovering, and this is all just on the back, back cover blur, but they're discovering bodies showing up in Hong Kong uh, 
uh, during and after typhoons. And if you've ever been through a typhoon or a hurricane, uh, those are very chaotic times hmm. and a great time to dump a body. Oh, man, that's so, cool. Well, so you know. those are the three, those are the three main plot lines that, uh, that the book follows. And, uh, somehow I managed to weave them all together into an ending that I'm proud of. It's exciting. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's the bulk of it. I'm excited to hear that. I mean, oh my God, that plot line, the amount of twists and turns that you can take it. Now, what I'm interested in is how did you handle the pacing? Again, without giving away too much of what the book is or giving away any spoilers, but how did you handle, did you go from a Game of Thrones type of thing where it's chapter point of view, then another, then another, then another, and everything interweaves? Yeah, effectively. Um, basically, it follows uh, Kit's point of view, um, Dallas's point of view, and uh, Johnny Wu's point of view. It doesn't. Uh, there's one other character that it follows briefly, um, and that's that's to illuminate something that happens to the uh, to the aircraft. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, I did that. I did POV jump, um, and uh, as far as pacing goes, you know, I wasn't really aware of pacing while I was initially creating this, um, but James Patterson, uh, he says pacing pays the electricity bill. So uh, I learned how to write tension um, through his master class to a certain degree and paid attention to some of the other classes I took uh, through UBC, uh, which is University of British Columbia here. And I took those creative writing classes on edX. Do you know what edX is, EDX? No, what is that? Harvard's, Harvard's online learning tool and uh, UBC teaches um, uh, three three-month classes via edX um, it's all pay for content uh, and their their professors are amazing so uh, so yeah how did I create the pacing uh, I jumped through POVs uh, I increased the uh, the amount of uh, the uh, the difficulty of the problems that Dallas was facing because that's because it has to always ramp up, right? Each uh, each problem that he faces must be more difficult than the previous. So yeah, like that. <laughs> no, yeah, that's a really good point. It's um, it's almost something that you make fun of sometimes in a movie trope, like when it, there's always like a, every time there's a countdown, the countdown is never ten minutes. It's always ten seconds. And it's one of those things that you almost like laugh at. It's like, how is it always that short? But that's the reason why. Like there always needs to be some level of attention, some reason why you're paying attention to the movie, the episode, the book, whatever the, the plot, whatever it is that you're writing about. It needs to be engaging, you know? Yep, I do, I do. Um, and uh, I actually recently took a class through uh, SFU, which is Simon Fraser, you here, just a fiction class, um, fiction two. And uh, we had a, a, a week discussing tension, and I learned a lot about it that I wish I'd known writing the sequence. Um, and uh, just like you, I'm working on the next one. So that's good. All of the things I learned in that class are going to go into the sequel. And uh, yeah, one of the big ones there was release of tension, which I think I did, but I didn't know that I was doing it <laughs> in this book. Because you can't just keep ramping up tension because uh, yeah. it's stressful for the reader, right? So uh, there has to be a release of tension and humor is a great way to do that. So, uh, I'm, so yeah, I'm excited to get into the next one and I am into the next one. Now, that is something I personally love. Just in my personal life, I love comedy. So I definitely understand that fully. I try to inject comedy in just after almost every dramatic moment because I think that's humorous that like sometimes things that seem very dramatic, if you just change the point of view of it slightly, it could be humorous. So if you right. just have like that, like, uh, and I don't think you should always point it on one character. I think you should kind of like shut it off because then that character just becomes like, oh, he is the comic relief. I Like, I I feel like you never would just want like a one character to be the void of that. Right. Um, but for the most part, I think that's like a, a great way. Like, how do you deal with that? How do you inject humor? Is it a dry wit? Is it more slapstick? Yeah, I mean, it's a bit of dry wit. Um, just the... Uh... Kit, Kit is uh, is quick and witty, um, and uh, and is disbelieving of the things that are happening to happening to her through the book. 
Um, so yeah, she she tends to yell at the other characters, and uh, like I said, I, I was I was injecting the humor, but I wasn't necessarily aware that I was doing it. I was I was simply looking through the eyes of the character and writing what they were seeing. Um, so I have a bit of me in there, I guess, dry wit. Mm. Um, but uh, but yeah, Kit's uh. Like I said, Kit's not a nice person, so she's a bit chirpy, right? Yeah. Like she'd do well on the ice as a hockey player. Yeah. Um. So yeah, just just between characters, I guess. Uh, it is. It's not. There isn't a lot of humor in there. Like I said, I wasn't as good maybe as at writing as I am now, uh, which sucks. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think I think this book is. Uh, I think I hit enough of the of the pacing. Uh, beats that uh, the people will enjoy it and they will they need to turn the page my beta readers have needed to turn the page and told me such awesome that's phenomenal that's one of the best things mm. you can hear yeah. now how do you think that you dealt with not just the main character but the side characters how did you flesh that out to, to make it seem that it wasn't just a story from the parent point of view of one of the characters but an actual world an actual area that is being inhabited um well it's kind of funny i mean i wrote this book from the point of view of kit and uh in dallas initially and i kind of got to the end and i had fifty thousand words <laughs> i was like excuse me this is not enough <laughs> right i need more so uh so i added the detectives um to a certain degree to to give a point of view that um that explains a little maybe or at least just allows the reader to see like just a different perspective on what's going on uh, and, and flesh out some of those ideas. So, uh, and I'm terrible for this. What was the question again, as I go off on tangents? No, what it was is that like, how did you flesh out the side characters? Oh, the side characters. Well, effectively I made them all main characters. Uh, hmm. So everyone kind of gets an equal amount of the book. It's, I mean, it's not all about Dallas. We, uh, we see Dallas, early on in the book and then there are multiple chapters uh f of, from kit's point of view and from johnny Wu's point of view so uh so yeah i i gave them all equal equal footing and uh and that really allowed me to not make it about any one necessarily necessarily one character but about about six hmm. and how did you find that different voice between those people because as you said it's, it's almost hard to not bleed in a little bit of your personalities into into the writing, so how do yeah. you really distinct those different voices? Uh, I think after the third or fourth hour of sitting down and writing from their point of view, I became those people, yeah. uh, and then those characters really started to come to life in my head. Uh, and I used to say that I have said that to my wife is that I really need those three or four hours of uninterrupted just writing, and you know, not maybe none of that would go into into the draft but at that point it's like a switch and uh and and then i am kit or i'm seeing through their eyes at least and writing what they're going to do versus uh what i think they would do or something along those lines Man, it's a strange I, it's a strange moment no i i love it because it seems like you you injected so much of your own knowledge, like even the whole thing that you said about like the hurricane, that's fascinating. Like I had, I had mm. never even considered that possibility before. How did well, you... I did? Oh, no, please go oh, ahead. Sorry. I, I lived in Hong Kong for seven years. Um, so uh, there's a lot of my experiences in this book uh, and a lot of my knowledge of Hong Kong in this book, uh, which at, at the end of the day, Hong Kong became a character uh, for me. Mm. Can you describe that a little bit? I mean, Hong Kong has a beating heart. Have you been? No. It's, uh, it really is. Um, I don't know how to describe it. It's, uh, it's a difficult thing to describe without, without going into dozens of pages, really. But uh, it's got a beating heart. And there's a lot to Hong Kong that is, uh, just has a depth to it. Um, that uh, you really need to be there to experience or read a book written by someone that's been there to experience it. And that's why um, you need to pick up 
this book gonna be out soon make sure mm. lucy and telford.com but oh, continue yeah um you know uh william gibson and i bring his name up a lot he uh he is my favorite author and he wrote a lot of his books in uh in and around tokyo um which is hong kong on another level but it it uh like i said there's a depth of field to hong kong that um I don't think you could describe to anyone that hasn't been. Um, and it's uh, it's vertical, it's built on the side of hills. Uh, there are highways that go between uh, high rises. Um, there are things that happen in Wan Chai and Long Kwai Fong that, um, you know, <laughs> it's, it makes Vegas look like kindergarten. Wow. Man, <laughs> that is fascinating. God, and how did you tackle the point of view of detectives? Um, yeah, that's a good question um, because I don't have any police work in my past, uh, but I do love a good police procedural. Hmm. Um, so I, how did I tackle them? I really drew on other television shows and other movies, other books I've read. Um, and also, like, uh, I have a lot of friends in Hong Kong um, that are local. Uh, so, I mean, I have had many, many, obviously, discussions over many beers with them and, um, and spent countless days and nights hanging out, wandering the streets uh, sometimes and going to some of those nightclubs that are in the book. So, really, Based, I, I really those two detectives are uh, an amalgamation probably of most of my Hong Kong local friends. In fact, one of them his name is Fong, and uh, and he's I acknowledge my buddy Keith Fong in the uh, in the back of the book in the acknowledgments because he helped me with some of the Cantonese translation, and I named one of the characters after him, which I did ask him for permission, but uh, but I only asked him after I was done the book. Yeah, it's usually like that. It it made me immediately think of. Um how did you deal with easter eggs and not even necessarily ones within like the, the plot of your book but i feel like when you get to that part that you're writing uh a, a nightclub that you specifically wanted to be fictional and you're thinking of a name you're like oh what am i going to think of the name you always go off some reference point or if you yeah. like go like a off like a random like a side character that's just like a, a passing name you always go like ah oh, crap like what do i what do i name it like whatever and you always reference like your own friends and whatnot do you have a lot of those or is that the, the name shout out the only one that you really have? I think probably too many, but um, yeah. Uh, yeah. And in fact, they call him, the reference is Fonger. Cause that's, we played hockey together in Hong Kong. And uh, so yeah, Fong, Keith Fong is my buddy. Um, Fonger is the, is the uh, nickname that we have for him. I very much stole that <laughs> and put it in the book. Uh, you know, there's a club named Drop. Uh, that I used to go to in uh, in Hong Kong, and that's in in the book as well. Uh, and there are some outdoor places in in the book that don't really have names, but uh, they are you know exact descript descriptions of how I remember them. I don't think Drops open anymore, so I feel okay about using that name. Mm. I think they've closed. Um, there's a yeah, there's a lot of that. There's a, so Dallas Ward is a nod to Max Ward, who's a very famous Canadian aviator. Uh, there's Jeffrey Dudna, who uh, I actually can't, um, can't remember her first name, but uh, Dudna, she won the uh, Nobel Peace Prize for coming up with CRISPR. And CRISPR is, if I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and get this right, is clustered regularly interspersed palindromic repeats, which is the genetic scissoring tool. <laughs> I know this is getting deep, but a genetic scissoring tool that said Jennifer Dudna, that's her name. Uh, she basically came up with, co-created with another geneticist. And that is what is allowing all of the things that I have uh, developed into this book. And it's happening today. We have CRISPR, we have uh, different versions of it, um, and it is evolving, you know, by the year. Yeah, I think my, one of my favorite things about it was, because um, you know how every time there's like a major scientific advancement, there's always like papers that come out immediately against it, right? Why it's going to be the end of the end of the world and all this crap, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I remember the year it came out. Well, I, I feel like I'm sure it came out much early, but I feel like it 
it came into my world of knowledge, I think in 2016, if I'm not mistaken, maybe a little bit earlier. Talk about 15, right. right? Um, and I remember one of the main concerns about it was not the first generation of, of CRISPR, but like when you go down to like the fifth generation and the only genes within the body are the CRISPR agents and how it can just keep mutating to points, just like any science, like if you limit your point of view of the data to like just the first five data points, it's going to be different when you compare it to like a million. So right. it, like, it's phenomenal, especially with genetics. I mean, like, it's the same thing as like, uh, as like body nourishment. Like we know some stuff, but we don't know everything. We've been at this for thousands of years. Yeah. Million. Yeah. <laughs> million. <laughs> um, yeah. So CRISPR, CRISPR is the, the, the basis of, of the, uh, the ethical questions that I bring up in this book. Hmm which is, this is a technology that is, could radically change humanity and do it quickly and permanently, uh, which is uh, when, you, when, when something is changed on the germline, <clears throat> that's permanent. Your child, that person's children will have that genetic change and they won't have a choice in the matter. So yeah, that's the, that's the crux of it. And nobody's, I, don't, I mean, there are people talking about this, the ethics behind it but uh the capability exists to do it to make a change in your backyard uh to i mean at the moment i think to do a germline change it's got to be in the embryo so i mean a backyard edit may be difficult to achieve but it, we're getting there and uh and if when we get there when people are capable of doing it in a, in a crawl space like this yeah <laughs> or a basement or a backyard lab and they can change their own uh, genetic sequence then uh how are we going to manage that oh my god uh my god i just i really thought of that fully and how that how that would affect human society i mean uh, imagine all the insecurities people have and if you had yeah. that possibility to just go and you know just like you know put something in your arm and just like mess with your dna wake up tomorrow like hey now i'm everything that i thought was imperfect in myself now i'm perfect yeah and now i'm different yeah. And now my children are going to be, they're going to have that genetic alteration and their children and their children. And, uh, like I said, it's permanent. And uh, yeah, so uh, so let's start the conversation really. And that, that's what I wanted to do to achieve with the book thematically really was nobody's talking about this and, uh, and we're capable of doing it now to a certain degree. And, uh, and science, as you know, is advancing at an exponential rate. So what's going to happen in 10 years? What's going to happen in 100 years when, uh, when someone like Kit, Kit McKee can change, and she's a brilliant geneticist, she can change anything with enough time. What's going to happen? And what if, what if it's distributed oh, that's via that's, a vaccine, right? What that's if, almost what like if you the, didn't even know? Oh, 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 oh. oh God. <laughs> uh, that's why the moment I just saw PL tell me about it. I was like, oh, you got to check this out, the sequence. I was like, oh, this is going to work way too well into uh, everything that's going on in today's world, which I love. My yeah. God, there, there's nothing, there's nothing better than that. And I think all the great, um, I think all the great books really do that. You look back at, you know, talking about Brave New World, talking about 1984, those were all done during like the heights of what people thought was going to be like these like crazy political evolving world shaping events. And like, that's what kind of gave the inspiration. And like, obviously COVID has been a huge inspiration to like a lot of different people. And the way that you were able to channel that into this book, uh, I, I'm, I'm enthralled, I'm enthralled. This is awesome. Now- That's great. Talk to me a little bit about the genre. Cause the reason I asked everything about the whole CRISPR thing was to kind of see the, the level of research that you've done into the sci-fi aspect, which seems pretty significant. So. And you've talked about that a lot of the things you drew inspiration from real life, but would you say that the world is fantastical? Uh, no, I don't think the world's fantastical. I think it's, uh, you know, it's obviously my interpretation of what this world will iterate into hmm. uh, in a hundred years. Um, you know, I, I, I wrote out America effectively uh, by iterating the wall. So, and I'm not giving away any spoilers here. So uh, I took I took Trump's wall and I iterated it uh, and integrated the reasons why they would build a wall uh, and retreat behind their borders um, into 
into the concepts of of genetic editing and uh, and fear. <clears throat> so uh, so the, you were asking about research. Like I said, I've got a memory like a sieve, so don't don't be afraid to remind me. Um, but uh, yeah, as, as far as the research going into the science fiction genre, is that what is that what we're discussing? Yeah, like um, what as I, far I, as like the genres go, like how much of it did you put in, in the book? How much research did you get into the science fiction aspect of it? If you got into horror detectives, we talked a little bit about that. But like, what is the background behind the genres and your research into them? Um, I, don't, I don't know if I did a lot of research into the genres, although I did a lot of reading, uh, and I do a lot of reading. And I'm sure, just like you, uh, I, I prefer to read science fiction. Yeah, well, um, that, that's really so, what I mean. Like, it, like yeah, even like okay. reading inspirations. Yeah, and like I said, you know, William Gibson is uh, is a strong in, inspiration for me. Um, the world he creates, I feel like, you know, without going into the far future stuff, I feel like I lived in one of those worlds in Hong Kong. Um, very much if you wanted to see what the future looks like just go there wow uh, you'll, you'll and you'll you'll see but um, yeah I think a lot of this happened just not necessarily out of research although if I wanted to learn about CRISPR I would spend days staring at a computer screen digging through uh, papers and, uh, and and a lot of stuff that I, I wouldn't retain uh, but I would take notes and then and then write the piece, write the chapter, write the, the bit, and then move on to the next thing. So a lot of this was, uh, was fire and forget, you know, do the hard work, write the piece, do more work, do more research, because that was uh, that's something I learned is that uh, the research really, be, uh, research into the scene is what's important. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it's not important for me to retain all of this knowledge that I would that I would dig up. And without being a geneticist or being a cop, uh, it's not important for me to retain all of that. So I, I did I did read into uh, the Hong Kong Police Force and what the structure was and where do their detectives what you know what what titles do they carry and uh, but at the end of the day, uh, someone I went to college with actually that worked in the uh, Special, special crimes division in the RCMP. And that's what made it into the book. Wow. Not, not necessarily the, uh, the Hong Kong police departments, you know, whatever they call it. Uh, it was the fact that, uh, like I said, a friend of mine who got out of aviation, but he was in aviation in the RCMP and was forced out of his role. He became a detective. And randomly I bumped into him on an airplane and uh, he talked about the special crime division. I was like, that, that sounds great. Can I use that? God, that is phenomenal. Like I asked because I'm so fascinated in the idea of like how much research can change your idea. Like you get this inception, it's like, oh, I'm going to make a story about genetic whatever. Then you research into it and then you realize, you know, maybe you find like limitations like, oh, you know what? I actually can't write that because that doesn't make any sense, but I can go this route with it. Did you find any of, did you face any challenges like that, that maybe you thought you would go one route and then like you looked a little bit into it and you're like, oh, actually, you know what? This actually seems a little more interesting. Uh, I don't know about more interesting, but I definitely uh, found that uh, doing some research, I was unable to find any sort of basis in reality for what I wanted to do. And mm -hmm. uh, it was a podcast I was listening to for some time and it was by uh, a detective and it was I can't remember what it's called detectives for authors basically and he would uh, authors are able to write into him uh, and he he does this podcast and answers their questions from a detective's point of view uh, so it gives some it gives some help and one one of the things he said was to never never let the truth get in the way of a good story so if I was doing some research into something and uh, and found that it was not really possible then, uh, then I kind of made it up <laughs> and went from there. So sometimes the research takes you to a dead end, or at least it took me to a dead end. Uh, and then I just tried to iterate it in a believable fashion and move forward with the tech that way. Like there's nobody flying ground effect jets for the mob yet. That, right? we, know they, that we know of. But there are, there are ground effect airplanes out there, although they were sort of developed a long time ago. And there are stealth planes out there, um, so the uh, the integration of those two makes sense. And you know, <laughs> they're 
there's a documentary on Netflix about these guys that were moving contraband and uh, they, they were trying to buy a submarine. Yeah. A, a nuclear submarine. Do you know that one? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was laughing when I watched it, but I was like, there are, this is how people are moving contraband today. They're moving, moving them using submarines. Yeah. A Russian new bomber, I think is what they try to like, get a decommissioned one from like 1960s. <laughs> yeah, and they exactly. did it. Yeah. And they, they yeah, they did it. So, yeah. <laughs> Fill it with drugs and uh, and move it. So uh, in in the same in the same vein, if you were moving contraband that maybe was biogenetic, uh, and a hundred years in the future, there's probably some leftover stealth jets that could be modified to be uh, to operate best in ground effect. And then uh, and then if you're going to move things for the monoblow, they're probably going to have something like that, right? My God, that is fascinating. Uh, just I, I love the I love really cool unique plot lines like that because I can just envision not only your story from it but the amount of things that if you felt like revisiting it in five years you can still pull so many stories off that like what is a what is a person that is maybe like a drug dealer you can make a whole story just from a drug dealer of the person trying to get that contraband right and uh, and there are no drug dealers in this oh, in this book fascinating but there uh, but there's lots there's lots of room I I, I agree with you. Lots okay. of room to go further. And how do you plan to go further? This is, is this book one in a ongoing thing? Yeah. Ongoing a trilogy? Thing. Um, initially, I had no intentions of, uh, of writing further. Um, and again, initially, this was a hobby and a creative outlet. Um, now, it seems like people are enjoying it. Uh, the very few people that have read it. Um, and so through Via NaNoWriMo, which is National Novel Writers Month, mm -hmm. Last November, I sat down and banged out 50,000 words of the next one uh, called False Ignition. Uh, and where am I going to go with it? I, I don't know how it's going to end yet. Okay, I've only got 50,000 words. What I wrote as the ending was a little tropey. Um, so I'm still uh, looking for ideas for how to continue that story. And uh, But my ideas for... For the for the further books, really, you know, when I wake up at three in the morning, I pick up my phone and I write out all the ideas that are coming through my head. I came up with an idea for a quad, quadrilogy and uh, and each one to address uh, a major theme, uh, something that we should probably be thinking about. So this one, the sequence, addresses the ethics of uh, of genetic engineering humans, um, and that's that's the overarching theme and uh the third one i want to talk about robotics and really that's that just comes from reading about boston dynamics who i think was just recently bought by hyundai and if you've ever seen any of their robots they are disturbing <laughs> disturbing um, there there's a yeah there's a video of a, of a robot taking an egg and holding the egg and being able to like you know crack it without like you know doing anything to it it peeled yeah. a grape and then it took like a cinder block and just said, pa! and I, like, it, like it was a fucking Bruce Lee, pa! like a Marvel right? superhero. Like it just like cracked to, all of then, it. Yeah. And then back to the egg, no problem. No problem. And they can do like a backflip. And I'm this is no joke. Like this is all possible. And the, the dogs that they have are like insane. Yeah. They use them for the military now. That's a, it's yeah, already, they're already military, the military use. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's insane. So, uh, so yeah, that's, those are my ideas. Um, just to address major, major themes. That I feel like, you know, these are these are things that are happening today. Like Boston, Boston Dynamics is something that's happening today. But you know, if you're not really into sci-fi or or tech in any way, like if I ask my wife about it, she she's never heard of Boston Boston Dynamics, and shortly no one else will because Hyundai just bought them. Um, so yeah, I I just I'd like to bring those things to light. Um, and uh, yeah, I actually can't remember what the next theme is. <laughs> I do have it written down somewhere. I immediately just started going on like my own thing. I was like, you know, like pollution could be one. An interesting one that I feel like uh, is talked about a little bit more now, but could have a lot more criteria is um, like the want for overcolonization. Like everyone wants to go to Mars, but what happens if we start, what happens if we actually make a society that geared towards that, that we just care so much more about colonizing a new planet instead of fixing what we have here? Common theme, right? A common theme. Yeah. We've got to fix this one. Yeah. Now, one of the things I, I think about for uh, 
for a future book is, uh, and I'm going to give away too many secrets here, but you know, what if, what if the way Mars is, what if the way Venus is, is what's coming for Earth? What if there was already a civilization there and they wrecked it and came to Earth and colonized Earth? What if that was the story? This is how my head works. No, I, uh, believe me, I'm. You unknowingly gave a plot line of my second book. That's ah. I, got, I got in there. Ah, we did it, <laughs> <laughs> Jinx. But uh, no, it's honestly it's why I love sci-fi because, especially like I, I don't know how you are, but when I got into this, my idea was like I want like a really unique idea. But then you start talking to people that are like minded, and you're like, ah, oh, shit. It's not really yeah. the idea. It's more the voice that matters. Like even if we both come up with different ideas and we wrote down us, uh, if we wrote down fifty thousand words, we're gonna have different plot lines completely, different pacing, different stories, different everything. Even though they're based on the same, mm. on the same principle, which is yep. uh, phenomenal. Because even that, I took it more of like Mars, because Mars is right there and just like it seems kind of like you know no atmosphere randomly, but there's like everything else. So, and to even go further, I mean like you you don't even know the the length. Maybe it could be like another <laughs> galaxy, and we just. I mean, look at our own history. We forget our own history within 200 years. Imagine like 4,000 yeah. when we're like migrating between like planets or, you know, the core of the earth. Who knows? Who knows? The amount of things that you can <laughs> play around with with this. But yeah, um, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, there's a lot of inter interesting things regarding Mars. Um, like, why doesn't it have an atmosphere? And uh, there's something something wrong with its with the core that's maybe not molten and it doesn't spin so it doesn't, doesn't and I don't know enough about this stuff but it uh, it doesn't create enough of a magnetic field to protect the atmosphere from being stripped away by the solar wind then maybe that's what's coming for Earth you, you know we're what? not going to be able to change that right no without a single doubt. You know what's the one that I have and again I feel like we're giving away a, a few like uh, future books here. But um, I, I just think it's fascinating. One of my, my most interesting thing, like anomalies in space, is the size of our moon. Every other moon to planet ratio is like, you know, Saturn, moon is a pebble. Like every moon that we know of, except ours, is 3% to 5% of the planet's mass. Ours is 40%. And Almost the mass- like a dual planet system. Yeah. And like just the- the, the way that we have like a sol like a solar eclipse like we're used to it because there's on the planet but the mathematical chances of that happening that like however like however we got the moon if it you know spun out during like like while earth was like in a molten state or like if it was um like an asteroid that just came, came into earth's gravity pull whatever it did the mathematical chance of it being the exact distance to block out the sun is like astronomical like what are the chances of that happening really so very very low yeah so is it is it engineered is that the question yeah well that that's kind of like what, what i asked and like uh again it's just fascinating but again and the chance of it actually happening i mean who knows we just don't know any we, we know so little about the things around us yeah um it reminds me of a book i'm reading right now called glorious it's by larry niven and can't remember the other author's name another prolific sci-fi writer and uh this is, this is what they're talking about. They, uh, they show up at a system, Earth, or, or humans, sorry, show up at a system and everything is just a little, it's, it's like you say, it's a, it's a dual planet system and they just come along where I'm at in the book. There's a, there's a tether between the two planets uh, and everything is very perfect. And uh, there's a black hole anomaly like further out into the system and, uh, and they're just figuring out what's going on. But uh, again, I, I didn't know that about the moon. I didn't know that it was mathematical chance of it actually blacking out the sun. It's Astronom astronomical. Astronomical. Because like, if I didn't it know was, because like, I mean, think about how they like, the sun is like this and the moon comes in. I mean, perfect. It fills it in perfect. It's not even that like, it's a little bit bigger and you feel like you see a little bit like the astronomical, like that, that for everything that we've had with the Hubble and everything, there is no other moon no other system nothing at all even close to that anywhere else that we've seen so far well i look forward to your book about it <laughs> <laughs> well a short story who knows we can we can compare yeah well kind of going off of that what do you think is the future outside of that you, you already talked about the quadrility with uh that you quadrilogy. have going quadrilogy did i say that right quadrilogy. yeah it's, 
yeah i feel like i made that up but yeah okay quadrilogy no, yeah i actually like that i was like i was like oh damn okay um but when you're through with that, do you ever think that you'll genre shift? Like we obviously just went on like a whole thing of like sci-fi, but do you ever go feel like going into a different route? Maybe do you think of going into cyberpunk in a, in a certain a- aspect? I think RPG lit for whatever reason is becoming pretty big, which is like you make a, kind of like Ready Player One type of thing. Right, right. Um, and we're talking about like first person POV type stuff. Is that? Oh, what, what, that? whatever. That's even more interesting. Like, okay. uh, but do you ever think I, you'll change I, your writing style? That's interesting too. Uh, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I know, I know, uh, I, I have read about the first like 50, 60 pages of your book, um, which is first person POV. Hmm. And, uh, and yeah, I'm always amazed at people that are able to write in first person POV. It's, uh, every time I try and every time I do it for class, it's just, it's just garbage. I just, I should not try. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I probably won't, won't really change the writing style. And, and really for me, like it, it's science fiction that, that, keeps me interested mm. and I think that's the most important thing for me for writing is is something I'm interested in and it's a world that you know I would love to read someone else that has written what I've got going on in my head so I I, I really feel like it's going to continue along those lines and once I'm done with this quadrilogy if, if I get there hopefully I'm going to get there uh it won't it won't be the same world that I'm writing about and mm. but I've, ne- I've never really considered writing like an outer space sci-fi um, book, but uh, but I'd love to give it a go. It takes time for all these ideas to rattle around in here, you know. Oh, believe me, yeah, it's and a- actually come come up with something. So uh, yeah. yeah, I'd love to give something sci-fi a go, but I've got to I've got to work through these characters and, and tell their stories before I'm able to to move into other people. And I I feel like three books, but maybe four. I like that a lot. And the reason I even bring it up, because in, in my book, it I did do first person point of view. But for this book, I'm working on, on a narrative thing. Like, I just want to try different okay. routes and, like, you know, because it was difficult without a single doubt to write in that, that first person point of view, because there's certain times that you want to divulge information that a first person point of view just wouldn't be able to do. And yeah. I had to just do that through different routes. But I think it's so fascinating to be able to talk from a narrative point of view. Um, so, again, it's just different writing styles and just beautiful thing how do you feel that coming into the writing community on uh, especially with fries and press because they, they do a lot of like you know we talked about it before the recording but they do a lot of like support how do you feel that support has helped you grow as an author uh, i think it's been critical um because i basically have been you know writing this by myself in a in a man cave or on the couch uh or in a chair and uh, sometimes on the porch um, yeah. without really any community or any, any, any help. Um, so that, it's Freezing Press uh, has been instrumental in showing me what community looks like. And, uh, and it, it, things like this would have never happened. Um, my promotions guy at uh, Freezing Press put me in touch with, with P.L. Stewart uh, and said, you know, he's one of our most successful authors. And, uh, and P.L. and I, we've had a couple of Zoom calls of just, you know, we talk for hours, <laughs> which, is, which is awesome, um, you know, and, uh, and we get along really well. And so he's put me in touch with his friends and his people. And, uh, and that's community. And yeah. I wasn't aware. I didn't, I was just completely unaware of how important the, the writing community is. And, uh, and so I'm very much a newborn in the, in the writing community uh, itself. And I, I'm still reaching out and, and I have very few contacts. Uh, and you and PL are the only two other authors I actually know. <laughs> so, so thank you for reaching out. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I'm learning. Uh, the writing community is all very new to me. Um, and, and, and until I was required to do promotion, I wasn't part of it. Uh, so, so yeah, um, like I said, still learning lots, uh, you know, trying to get involved up here in Whistler. And it's a very small community up here, right? It's like 10 or 12,000 full-time residents and a wow. few writers. Then there, there is a writer's community here, one bookstore. Um, but again, uh, it, it's been hard for me to, to dive right in without an actual product other than this one. And I'm refusing to give this one away because it's the only one that exists. Um, so yeah, how have you found it uh, with being part of the community? And, uh, and what lessons could you teach me? 
Man, uh, I, I got to tell you, when I started this podcast, I mean, I'm smiling because I just empathize with your story so much. I mean, down to the man cave thing. I mean, I also like to write on my couch. I don't know what it is. I, I do I like don't the chair. Know what it is either. But it's pre- the couch. I, don't, uh. I, I prefer writing on the couch. I'm the same. Yep. Sitting here. I mean, some it's great for editing. I find so I got a couple screens and, uh, and we're working through edits. I find is okay here, but man, the couch. What is it about the couch? Uh, <laughs> days melt away on that couch. I don't know what it is. I truly I, like no exaggeration. I agree. Uh, but I, I empathize with it so much because I was just like completely in my head. And then I started realizing, I was like, you know what, in order for pre-promotion of the book, as I'm going through the process, I thought it would be interesting that, you know, you know, 10 down, 10 years down the line, if somebody is like a, a fan of my book series, they can go back and be like, oh, this is actually when he recorded it. This is actually like him going through it. And so I really developed the beginning of the podcast, not even for now, but like way down the line, if anybody was ever interested. Right. But then the moment I started recording, I realized that it was like, why shouldn't I include other people? Like the amount of people that are in my same exact shoes is outstanding. So I started just out of curiosity, reaching out to one or two people. Then, you know, those people talked to like their friends and they would reach out to me and I would reach out to new people. And now the, the community is, is phenomenal. The amount of people that come in and help you. PL Stewart is a great example. There is another, just because... My favorite thing about the community isn't that there's one person that has the complete answer as much as if you pull everything together and the amount of information you can pull from everyone is outstanding. PL, his marketing on Twitter is on a different level. I agree. On a different level. Yeah. I just want to learn and be anywhere near like he is on Twitter. It's crazy. 20,000 followers, something. Yeah, I think it's like touching 21, if not, it, it always out. And I met him when it was like at the 3000 level. Right. And okay. it grew, and that was only in a, a couple months it, it is where he's at now. And it's just like everything he does, like even like him, like retweeting you, like that's guaranteed to get you at least a, a couple more likes than you would have just putting it on your own. Yeah. Phenomenal. And then you compare somebody like uh, Nikki Beebe, who is more on like, the Instagram side, and her marketing on her side is just, intense like a lot of authors that i have on instagram they'll post something and they'll get uh they'll get a, a reasonable amount of likes and then a couple comments saying like oh you know that's cool that's awesome like you know of support she posts something and there's genuine people hopping on and like talking about it like she generally ha- she's built a community so little things like that are like things to pay attention to like the way that people not only market them market their book but market themselves in a way right. that not only makes you want to root for the content that they, that they release, but root for them as authors. Like, yeah, I want to buy your merch when you release it. I want to buy a cup that has your shitty graphic on it (laughs) 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 just to support you like that. Like, you know, things like that are really interesting to me. And the more people that you learn, the more people that you meet and even people that are inexperienced teach you so much. Uh, You know, people that are just coming into this. I feel like I learned just as much because I'm in, I'm only a couple a couple months ahead of you and even then right. what, from what we talked about in the beginning of the of the podcast even then you know we're at we're at different stages like like the whole Kirkus review thing that you have is coming out soon I, i'm excited for you to get that i mean that's just a, a phenomenal experience uh but walk me through that like pl and oh. and uh, sean both like talked about it and like they talked about how much of an uh it's almost like uh uh like waiting for something phenomenal but scary you it's, know yeah it's both yeah exactly it, it is a terrifying moment and I, I know you've been through this which is uh which is finally putting it out yeah and saying all right you know what this is done and, and now it's not up to me anymore now it's now it's up to everyone else whether it's good or mediocre or shitty yeah it's not on it's not on me anymore and uh and i've never been more terrified in my life and uh and i have flown 747s and challenging conditions um and i've never been so scared in my life as uh, as this moment i'm waiting for kirkus and kirkus can be brutal with their reviews yes right they, they pull no punches um so yeah waiting for those two reviews is uh is scary and uh the, I think PL was the first person I sent the arc to. And like, I, I had a moment <laughs> where I was, I was really unwilling to send it because it was the first time anyone had 
I was really sending it to anyone as a complete product other than my editor uh, to say, what do you think? <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, but eventually like anything, you've got to let it go. Right. I know I'm, I'm, I'm getting better at letting it go. Uh, I was at a friend's place last night and there was uh, 10 or 11 of, of them there and I brought it, I brought this. And of course everyone picks it up and they're like, wow, this is awesome. Nobody reads anything. And they say, tell me about it, but yeah. uh, Clap your shoulder. Hey, like, good job, buddy. Yeah, it was a lot of that, a lot of yeah. that. But um, yeah, I, you know, that's I think I feel like that's part of the process for me, which is yeah. uh, which is, you know, gaining confidence by saying, here's the actual book, <laughs> and then some of the people read the back cover and uh, read the copy, and uh, and they're like, oh, one person out of that group of let's say a dozen jumped on Goodreads and clicked want to read, so that's that's all part of the promotional process, I guess, which I'm learning. Yeah. Uh, and gaining confidence talking about it. This is my first podcast, and I was very nervous before <laughs> before we started. I'm a little nervous now still. But, no, uh, but yeah, no, go ahead. No, I, I it, it's so funny because I, I just empathize with it so much. Even I myself, I've talked about this for months, and I've only just now recently got actually comfortable with people asking me about the book. I can talk about somebody else's book until years with hours but then when that person yep. just goes around like oh so tell me about your book i'm there like oh when yeah, i came I yeah when I, when I came back from dr they're stopping me at the um, at immigration and you know like immigration cops they never asked anything like in a nice way so like they're like all right so what do, you, what do you do for work and i'm there like stunned because like you know if you asked me like a couple months ago i was like oh i'm an engineer but now i was like oh i'm an author and then and he just like put like puts his eye up and he goes like oh uh is your book out yet and i'm like oh no you know it's gonna come out in a couple months like just i think like shifty and he goes like, oh tell me about the book and i just claim up right there i'm like yeah listen i got i got nothing i don't know <laughs> I it's nothing. a sci-fi two people are in it uh, uh, there's an alien or two i don't know dude what do you want from me? <laughs> i fully understand i fully uh, understand it's uh, difficult, difficult. Yeah, so yeah. My, the elevator pitch rehearsal is important to do but then it's like telling someone i know Re uh, reciting the elevator pitch makes it sound weird to me and now, now I, I gotta rethink the elevator pitch to say uh this is what the book's about people because people everybody asks oh tell me what the book's about and i can't say kit mckee is the world's leading genetic editor i can't say that to someone in person right it doesn't yeah. work well so, yeah it's, i'm learning i'm learning well my main thing when it comes to that and i think like why it's so hard for authors in order to like kind of talk about their own work is kind of like um you know, if you watch like a movie or a TV show that you really like, and I would ask you, oh, what is that show about? Like, have you, even if you haven't watched it, I'm sure you've heard of the show Lost, right? Yeah, I watched it back right? in the day. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So if we were to ask the fans of that show, what was it about? It was like, oh, it's about this uh, Dharma initiative and the polar bears and the, and the islands and like this fog monster and all these crazy things. You would have asked the, the show creators what it's about. It's like, oh, it's about people dealing with like their traumas and like letting go of their emotions and all that. So it's like the amount of distance between that when you're so close to a project as opposed to the people interpreting the project, I think it's why it's hard. Because yeah. when I uh, you asked me about the book, instead of going into like, you know, the cool poppy stuff that people want to hear about, it's like, oh, it's about a clone revolution and this is not. I talk about it's like, oh, well, there's two characters like, you know, finding themselves, da 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 da. Just like, all right, well, well a self help book? What is this, Oprah? Like, what are we doing here? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's hard when people ask you about the theme, right? Because, and, and we, we went through this earlier in the, the podcast. I mean, it is a hero's journey about Dallas Ward. Yeah. Um, and, but that's, you know, that's, I know that because I wrote it, but. You, you know, a reader might not even know what a hero's journey is. Mm -hmm. They just know that they enjoy books that are paced tightly and uh, and are a thriller and involve police procedural stuff. And then with a sci-fi tech slant to it, they might they just might enjoy that and, and never know any of the rest of the stuff that you and I will agonize over on the couch with our laptops. Yeah. Right. Uh, no, I'm telling. Like it's it's one of my favorite things about art, where how you can bring a good friend of yours not even like a person that you generally have been a, a, that is a genuine good friend of yours for 15 years you take them to an art show and you both look at the same piece of art and you can stand there and be like oh the emotion it conveys like gee like look at the the the, the paint strokes and all that and the other person's there it's like dude what 
I wouldn't, <laughs> if you gave this to me for free, I wouldn't take it into my house. This is the worst thing I've ever seen in my entire life. It's a collection of like paintbrushes. And that goes for all of art. That goes for like writing. There's certain people that can read your work and just be like, oh, that was like a really cool detective behavioral thing and completely glaze over the sci-fi aspect. It's like, oh yeah, I didn't even really yeah. pay attention to that. Then they notice. Yeah. yeah. And then me and you will geek about it. It's like, oh dude, how did he even think about all this stuff? Oh, can you imagine? Yeah. What, what are you going to do with a, you know, are you going to continue the story of Dallas? I, you yeah. got you, you nerd, gotta yeah. you gotta love it yeah i do i do i love talking to people uh that have read it but again is it's there those are a few few numbers yeah uh peel was really excited uh that was that was something really neat to experience with, oh yeah uh, for pl, for PL to else. see he blew up right <laughs> he's like blew my mind and he said it's not like i was expecting you to write a bad book He's like, but I kind of expected you to write a bad book. And he's like, this book was anything but. It was beyond any of his imagination. So it was, uh, that was nice to hear. Self-promotion, pat on the back. <laughs> no, no. Uh, PL, uh, PL's a, a really good dude. I mean, like, uh, and it's, it's awesome that he actually generally does, like, every person that he's brought through it to this podcast, like, recommendation, has, like, really knocked it out. It's not, like, low-key or, like, joking around by any degree. Like, they really, like, come to it. Like, I feel like when he gives you... he, I, he, I feel he's approaching Oprah book level, stamp level, where, like, when he gives yeah, you that I, review, it's like, oh, shit, okay. I feel I feel the same. Yeah. Crazy. And he does a lot of reviews. Yeah, yeah. How does he find the time now that I think about it? Because it's not like... I he, don't understand. He still either. works. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Full-time job. Yeah, and wife, he, he definitely pays attention to. I mean, like, it's it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. Just yeah. like the, the kudos yeah. they, they can give to that man. Yeah, he's um, an inspiration for sure. Yeah, and kudos to, you know, Fries and Press. Like, you shout out to them, everything that they've been doing, the whole community that you've helped you build. And just, uh, this is a really, it's really deep waters around here. It's It really helps sometimes to at least have a, a, a buoy every here and here to let you know you're going in the right direction. That's fantastic. I love that. I love that analogy. It, it is very deep waters, and uh, and I can't see land right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, the worst um, part is that it's midnight in the middle of the uh, Atlantic. Like yeah, you, exactly. You look up exactly. and you look down, and it looks the same. <laughs> yeah, I have I have one or two boys around me, which which I'm hanging on to quite tightly at the moment. But yeah. uh, it'll get better. It'll get better. Uh, and the more I talk about it with, with guys like you, uh, the more I'll get better at it, and I'll get better at being on a podcast like this. No, this was great. I mean, th- I mean, I had I had a phenomenal time. I've loved like just picking it down your brain, picking up what the, the book is going to be the sequence. I mean, my God, do you ha- what is the official release date on it so people know? Uh, I don't have an official date. Uh, we're working at the end of August right now. Um, basically, they uh, the this this came back in the in the arc format, um, and uh, and I, I'm sure you know what this is like. I read through it again. And pulled my hair out in a couple of places, and I was like, "I've gotta, I've gotta make, I've gotta make this change, and I've gotta make this other change." So I talked to my point of contact at uh, at Frisian Press, and I was like, "I want to make some changes." And he said, "It's got to be less than ten, otherwise, uh, you know, it's gonna cost some money." Yeah. Uh, and I was like, "Okay, okay, okay." And I sat back here and I edited, and I, I think I got it to like eleven changes, and some of it is stuff that got missed on the proofread by me, and and. Uh, and a proofreader there so and that's just like punctuation but some of it was was content that I, I couldn't couldn't read anymore you know I couldn't read it over and say I'm willing to let that go so yeah. it was a bit of that um and then of course we're gonna have to change the uh put the the reviews on it so um end of August is the answer the long-winded answer to that question end of August no, I don't think that's long winded at all. If anything, with the amount of stress you went through, that you, that could have been a half hour segment right there. <laughs> Believe me, I have been through it. I mean, look, there's a reason I have two of these proofs because you get one and you're like, son of a bitch, how did I miss that? How did I get this far? How is that even possible? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I fully understand. It was a difficult moment. Yeah, my favorite is uh, the hanging um, quotation marks. Like when, when there's just like that one orphan line of a quotation mark instead of like it, uh, it being- it got missed. Yeah, they just got missed. And it's always Ugh. one. It's not that it's yeah. glaring. It's like that one in chapter like 19 randomly. Like, oh, yeah. what the How hell? How did that get missed? Yeah. 
Yeah, now you yeah. got to redo the entire PDF, convert it to EPUB again, which is not an easy yeah. task. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I have a period that, or I had a period that needed to be a colon in at the very end of the book. <laughs> you know that sort of thing. Uh, oh my god! And it, you know what? And the the roller coaster, I think, is my favorite part of of this whole thing, where you get that one review, you get that one PL thing, and you're like, oh my god, who is Stephen King? I'm that person right here. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> you know what I mean? It is like, Lucian Telford today. Yeah. Immediately, you're like, you're like, you're at that Joe Rogan podcast. It's like, yeah, you know, I just started about my first book. Who gives a fuck? You know, I'm a millionaire now. <laughs> uh, exactly. And then, and then you just get that one person that you give it to. That it's not even, they don't even give you a bad review, but it's like, oh, did you mean to do this? And you're like, mm-hmm. Why I haven't had that write? yet. I'm, I, I'm sure it's coming. I'm sure it's coming. Touch me. Yeah, but, no, uh, yeah. I just haven't given it out enough. That's all. Oh my god, no, it's not even on on the book itself. It's more like uh, I just got that for my book two thing. Which, fair enough, never give out a first draft. I should have learned that nope. lesson. Never, never, <laughs> ever, 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 ever hand out a first draft. But you see, I was you feeling confident. Good. You think yeah. it's good? Yeah, like, I, I never written it, written anything this good in my life. Exactly. And I was you're in. you're a hundred percent wrong. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Yep. There's like, oh, wait a minute. Are they even, I got one that was telling me, like, where even are they? And I'm like, wait a minute. I thought I put desert at least 22 times in that chapter. Like, what do you mean? Where are they? And, and like, you get defensive immediately, but then you start thinking, it's like, wait, how much did I fuck up? That they're asking me about the setting. <laughs> <laughs> Basics. Yeah. Uh, never like, hand it out. Never yeah. hand it out. Uh, but again, I love the process. I love talking to you. If you ever want to come and talk to me about book two i mean more than welcome any fries and brother sister just family member always welcome on, on, on this podcast and again just to wrap it up where can people find you the website the instagram end of august okay. people mark your calendars the sequence you can find me at lucy and telford on twitter and on instagram and you can read more about uh me uh, at www.lucientelfordbooks.com. You can also find me on Goodreads. Uh, and I believe that's uh, Lucian Telford. There we go. Now, do you have any final thoughts right before we wrap up? Any last comment that you want to say to the people? You know, ramp them up for the... For the... Ramp them up for the release? Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I, think, I think this is, uh, is going to touch a lot of people. Right? It's a... Uh, like I said, it's, it's a book about the characters, uh, very much so. And to me, at least, they very much come alive in this book uh, and are interesting enough to want to know more. Uh, and if, uh, if you have any interest in genetics or in uh, iteration of tech, uh, I've done my best to see where things that exist today in uh, infantile form go in 100 years. Mm. and i think that's like the crux of sci-fi right there so if you're a fan of sci-fi make sure to get into it and i mean just everything else sci-fi is awesome but like all the the, the detective the whole like the thing with the genetics i mean the whole drug running thing the bodies in the hurricane i mean people this is the book to watch out for i mean what are we doing here make sure to do so look into this author i'm telling you I'm amped. This is the, no bullshit here. No smoke. This is this is really awesome. I'm really amped for your content. And I really hope you, the best, the best of most success, everything, everything there is, just all that energy to you towards you. And I really believe in this too, honestly. Like you got me excited. This is awesome. Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, it's been great being here. I really uh, appreciate the uh, offer and the opportunity to be on a podcast. And this is my first ever podcast interview. Well, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Thank you again. This is the end of the podcast, AR's Tales, a.k.a. the ART Podcast. I've been A.R. Minabal. This has been Lucien Telford. Make sure to look into this man. Like, I don't know what you're doing if you're not. And if you're not hip to it, make sure that you are. This is the end. Watch out for us next Friday and Monday when we have a new episode. Peace out.